Okay, hi everyone. So we're here with a very juicy question, right? 2016 Q17. So we have a we're we're given that a roller coaster is coming down over here and it's going to enter this loop and we want to make sure that when it's at the top, right, it doesn't fall down because the, the roller coaster is not attached to the track, right? The car is not attached to the track. So um yeah, so so this is similar to a bit of intuition for what's going on over here is when you hold a bucket of water, right? When you hold a bucket of water and as a water bucket and you swing it one round above your head, right? Um it, if you swing it fast enough, the water doesn't spill on you. And so it's a similar physics in this case, right? Um technically speaking, it's called centrifugal force, but in this case we're going to discuss it in the context of centripetal force because we haven't discussed centrifugal yet. Um, centrifugal is for another day, but for in this case, we're going to reason it out in terms of centripetal force and purely centripetal force, right? I'm just mentioning the word centrifugal so that if you've heard of it, then this is... Yeah, i just name-dropping it, but we won't go into too much detail today. So, um, okay, so where, where do we begin? Right, First of all, we note that we have, uh, we have the cut over here and there's one loop like this. So at the top, right, what are the forces acting on the cut at the top? There's the gravitational force, mg, and there's also normal contact force, right, between the track and the cut, right? So the key observation I want to mention over here is that the normal contact force does not, does not do work, okay? Because the velocity, right, the, the motion is always parallel to the track, right? At least until until it reaches up here, the the motion is always parallel to the track, right? And even here, the normal contact force, right? If it leaves the track, then the normal contact force is zero anyway. But the point is that normal contact force doesn't do work; it never does work, okay? And because of that, right? Because of that, we can conclude that gravitational force is the only one doing work, and hence GPE plus Ke is constant throughout the entire motion, and um, yeah. So this is this this GPE plus Ke is constant. Something we usually take for granted, and usually you don't think too much about it, and it's usually quite intuitive. But I the reason why I'm mentioning it in this case is because I believe um, conceptually it is quite important to remember that the only reason why we can take we can do something like that is because the other forces do not do work on the cut. If there's let's say uh, let's say there's a hand pushing it, then you actually need to add in the work done by the hand also. Okay? But anyway, um if you didn't understand that it's okay, right? Just I was just explaining why GPE plus K is constant, right? But if not, you can just remember that we learned this in primary school, right? Gravitational potential energy is converted to kinetic energy and so on. So yeah, we can just take this as a fact for now. I just uh I was just explaining a bit of the nuance behind it. Okay, but anyway, without further ado, right, let's let's start with the question. So let's say I, I prefer the work in terms of symbols instead of concrete numbers. And then at the end step I'll substitute in the symbols. So I'm gonna let H be the height 120 meters and um M be the mass with 360 kg. But it turns out actually the mass doesn't really matter. It cancels out in the end, at least for this question. And so um so initially Right when the cut is at the top, what is the gravitational potential energy? The GPE was just mgh, right? And the Ke, right? Because the cut is initially at rest, the, the Ke is zero. Okay, and so at the bottom, right, of the motion, when the cut is over here, it's moving at some velocity. Uh, let it be u, okay? And so what is what 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 is the gravitational potential energy at the bottom? In this case. Taking because we took here to be zero, zero height, zero meters, right? So the gravitational potential energy, gravitational potential energy is zero. And but there's some ke, right? It's half m u squared. Okay. And so yeah, that, that that that's the first phase of motion when it falls from 120 meters down to the ground level. Then after that, it starts to go up again here. And over here, let's say it reaches the top and there's some velocity v. Right, of course, the velocity v is going to be smaller than u because some of the ke is converted from, uh, some of the kinetic energy is converted into gravitational potential energy, um, and so how much 
how much how much ke to be precise right is going to be uh the gpe is going to be mg times 2r and the ke is going to be half mv squared okay so putting this all together um we're going to use this later right but for now let's focus a bit of our attention on the motion at the top okay so we see that this is a this loop is a circular motion right? and remember if we set the origin we, we consider the center of this circle this circular motion then what do we know about the force required to keep an object in circular motion we know that um, in order to keep an object at a constant radius right, at, a, at a constant radius from some fixed point the force acting on the object needs to be number one it needs to be radially inward right and number two it needs to be equals to m omega squared r so so the loop if we draw the loop like this right here when it's moving at v there needs to be a force right net the net force acting must be fr equals to m omega squared r right where r is the radius of this motion so what provides this what provides this um centripetal force right so this is known as centripetal force if you're not sure why you're not sure how we arrived here uh, please check out the previous videos where i mentioned i derived the centripetal force so how do you, so what provides this centripetal force in this case what provides the centripetal force is going to be the normal contact force and between the track and the and the, the car and and also right mg gravitational force right do note that this is just taking a snapshot when the car is at the top because that's what we're concerned with right if the car was let's say over here then n will be like this and mg will like this and we can work it out also but in this case we're not concerned with what happens at the side right only concerned with what happens at the very top so f of r is equals to n plus mg okay n plus mg is what provides the centripetal force right in order to keep the object at a constant radius r and angular velocity omega so so yeah okay okay so but we don't really like this omega over here right i didn't really define omega in the question and um and omega in fact uh is is not even a constant right it, it actually changes as we go around the circle right because ke is converted to gpe so instead of writing in omega right over here i'm actually this omega actually refers to omega at the top of the circle okay and i'm actually going to convert it into velocity right so using the fact that v is equal to omega r right i can rewrite this m omega squared r as mv squared over r okay and so what do we have here right we have we have two equations now and namely we're actually going to i'm going to rearrange the second equation here into the form of n is equals to m v squared over r minus m g okay and the reason why i'm doing this is because what do we what do we what do we know about the force n right the normal contact force is a force that will only will only um will only be as big as it needs to right and what 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 do I mean by that? There's, I have I have a lecture where I emphasize the nuance of normal contact force, friction, and tension, and you should if you're not sure you should watch that, right? But what I mean by normal contact force is only as large as it needs to is that in this case the only job of normal contact force is to prevent the car from sinking into the track, okay? And that means that um if 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 let's say if let's say g okay. And let and that means that n will only work as hard as it ever needs to, right? That's one extreme case, right? And what's the other extreme case? The other extreme case is when n when when n is going to be zero, right? If if the car is gonna fall off, there's nothing. If the car is gonna fall off, it's gonna lose contact. There's nothing n can do to save that situation, right? N n is unable to pull pull the car up, right? It's unable to pull the car up. 
is unable to pull the car up because we are assuming that the car is not attached to the track. If the car was attached to the track, then yes, the, 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 the normal contact force can pull the car up. It can hold the car up. Right. But in this case, if let's say MG was very, very big, right, then negative MG will be very small and N will be very small. And specifically, if N was going to be so small that it's going to be less than zero, then N is going to be like, sorry, I tried my best. Right? There's no way I can give you a negative normal contact force. Right, because the car is not attached to the track. So um, the n, the upshot is that n is actually going to be always greater than or equals to zero. Right, so once again, if the reason behind this um, greater than or equals to zero is unclear again, we, you can rewatch one of my uh, forces on one of my uh, lectures on normal contact force. Um, but this is a very important nuance right, for this question. The normal contact force is always going to be pushing the cart away, right, preventing the cart from sinking into the track but the, no, the normal contact force is unable to be negative because that would imply that the, no, the the track is holding on to the cart and we know that the cart is not attached to the track okay so enough on that right n is greater than equals to zero um yeah but that puts a uh, that actually puts a uh, inequality on v squared right so n is greater than zero that's cool but what we what we can we can use this to put an inequality on v squared specifically right mv squared is greater than or equals to mgr okay so this is one inequality that tells you um the velocity right the velocity at the top must be greater than or equals to mgr and basically this is saying the velocity at the top must be big enough right if it's not big enough right it's going to drop just just th and this is very intuitive because you know when you swing a bucket of water right, when you swing a bucket of water over your head right in a circular motion your velocity there must be big enough also right it must be big enough b must be big enough such that the water won't drop on you so likewise the velocity of the car must be big enough at the top in order for the car not to drop and lose contact with the roller with, with the track okay so mv squared is bigger than mgr right you can cancel out the m's doesn't really matter okay so let's return back to our previous equation over here our previous equation over here was um related mgh right to this right so we, we actually don't really care about the center quality right we can actually substitute in this equation into here so how would that look like Right. So remember, at the end of the day, we're trying to find a maximum radius r. So we're going to try to get something of the form r is greater than or equal to something, something, something. Okay, so, so we're trying to get that form. So it will be helpful if we rearrange the first equation here into the form of 2mgr equals to mgh uh, minus half mv squared. Okay, so we're just rearranging it such that we have R on one side, right? And and yeah, so so this minus half mv squared, right? You see over here there's mv squared. So minus half mv squared must be less than equals to minus half mg r. Okay? So two mg r must be less than or equals to this, right? And we can cancel out the m's, cancel out the g's, so we get two r less than or equals to h minus half r so you, we see that r is on the left and on the right so we need to bring it to one side 5 over 2 r is less than equals to h and hence h, uh, r is less than equals to 2 over 5 h and what is 2 over 5 h h in this case is we're just substituting in the values back in right so h is 120 so 2 over 5 times 120 that gives me 48 right 48 meters and r must be less than equals to 48 meters. So the maximum possible radius we can have is 48 meters. The answer is C. Okay, so so that's uh that's how you do this question. And the intuition, roughly speaking, is that if you have a very big radius, right, if radius is very, very huge, then the kinetic energy when it goes to the top, right, is going to be one factor is that the Ke. Right, so one factor that big radius is going to cause is that Ke at top is going to be small. 
right? And that's bad because if the k is small, the velocity is small, right? Then we know that from the swinging bucket analogy, you swing a bucket and at the top you're not fast enough, water is going to drop on you. Likewise, if the car goes to the top and it's not fast enough, the car is going to drop. Right? So that's the first effect of big radius. If you have a big radius, the k at the top is small, velocity is small, the car is going to drop. And the second effect, right? The second effect is that um, is in the form of this m omega squared r over here, right? Or m v squared over r. So it also affects the centrif centrif the necessary centripetal force, um, centripetal force, right? It also affects the necessary centripetal force, right? So yeah, so that's how you do this question, and this is the physical intuition behind it, but in this case, um, the equations, the physical intuition is not going to be enough, right? The equations are what's going to get us the answer. So I'll see you in the next video.